Welcome back. I uh, really, really appreciated the talks this morning, as I know most of you have, probably all of you. Um, and the material that we're hearing, what Paul was conveying to us, is really close to my heart because it's something that I have studied those issues for probably about 40 years now. And uh, I'm telling you, what he's saying is true. And he could, probably could have gone on for a couple more hours just to, you know, chip away at the surface. But I think that what I've come down to is what does that information do for you? Because you can go on forever with it, and there's got to be value to it. And for me, it comes down to a Bible verse, which is Proverbs 1, 7, that I believe, I believe, and I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, that this is like a gateway to understanding. And it's in and, and the, the verse is Proverbs 1, 7, and it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but the fools despise wisdom and instruction. And you see, it's kind of like you can't, you really can't understand. You can't understand spiritual matters without wisdom. All of us have known people that are really smart, but they're not very wise, right? And if you had a choice of smart or wisdom, which would you take? Well, anyway, I believe it. And if you doubt it, use some Bible search uh, website and type in the fear of the Lord and look at the hundred different places it's in the Bible. I'm just throwing a number out there, but it's in a lot. And read it in context to see if that isn't true. And so we think we have a foolish nation out there. There's a good reason. And it's because of a lack of the fear of the Lord. So the, what I'm getting at is the, the message that uh, Paul was giving and really all the guys is that this is not a safe place. This is a very dangerous place, and it's easy to think in America that we're in a safe place if we got, you know, a place to live and and food on the table, but, you know, things can change. I, I played golf with a guy who is a Coast Guard. He works for the Coast Guard. And I said to him, um, you know, this place could change in one hour our whole world could turn upside down. Is that right? He said, yes, it's very true. So anyway, um, that's my little message, and I want to invite Chris up. You're up, brother. And uh, could you open with prayer? Okay. Thank you. All right. Praise the Lord, you guys. Good to see everybody again today. Why don't we start with a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father above, Lord God, we all come before you together in this fellowship here in Fargo. Father, we just thank you for this time of fellowship together. We, we thank you for this time of edification, this time of learning, Lord. And Father, we, we thank you that we're able to gather together with like-minded people who put faith in you and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. People who walk in the fear of God and people who desire to know your will, O oh Lord. And we pray, Lord, that through this conference and the information that's being communicated here from all of the speakers and communicated by people even out in the audience uh, during the break times and so on, Lord, may we have wisdom, Father. May we be as the sons of Issachar who knew the times and who knew what Israel ought to do. Father, we just pray that your wisdom will be upon us uh, and inspire us, Lord, and open our eyes so that we can be your good and faithful servants and to shine as your bright lights uh, during this time upon the earth. Please, Lord, be with me. Help me to speak well today, to speak words of edification and learning. And I pray, Lord, that this presentation will be a blessing for those who hear it. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, are we still on? All right, praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. Okay, so those of you who were here yesterday, you know that uh, I've been speaking here about Islam and Islam in Western civilization. Now, I know on the program it said that I was going to talk about textual criticism today, twice today. Actually, what I'm going to do is, problem is the information that I was uncovering about Islam in the West and from the period of World War II just became so overwhelming so I ended up calling Tim uh, before the conference and I said this is just too much information I don't think I can get it in in two presentations and so we agreed that I would go ahead and, and do all four parts on this but later on today I am going to include at the beginning of part four uh, what I think why I think the whole issue of textual criticism and the Bible and really the Bible overall um, Jay, in, in his presentation, I really appreciated much of what he was saying yesterday just about the importance of keeping God's word as our foundation. The way that our forefathers were able to rescue the world out of the dark age was by recovering the word of God. And whenever the powers of evil uh, have oppressed the world, they usually begin by attacking the word of God. That's why we spent so much time in our history of the Bible uh, reminding modern-day believers that Rome, that, that the Dark Age happened. Some people think that the Inquisition, for example, was about the church trying to force people to become Christians. That's not the Inquisition, brethren. The Inquisition did not do that at all. The Inquisition outlawed the Bible. You could not own a Bible. If you owned a Bible in the vernacular tongue in your own language, you would be arrested, you would be put to death. The Lollard preachers who were the followers of uh, John Wycliffe in the 14th century, uh, they were arrested because they had Bibles and their Bibles were chained around their necks and then they were burnt at the stakes, at the stake with their Bibles chained around their necks. So the Inquisition outlawed the Bible. The Inquisition outlawed preaching the gospel. You could not preach the gospel freely under the Inquisition. The Inquisition outlawed the Ten Commandments. Many people don't read, because they don't teach you this in school anymore. But you can find multiple accounts of parents who were put to death because it was discovered they were teaching their children the Ten Commandments. That was the Inquisition. Now, the reason they don't want us to know this, I believe, the reason they've changed our history books, which is provable that they've done this, the reason they've done it is because if you knew what the Inquisition was really about, you would begin to recognize that what's happening in our country with groups like the ACLU is nearly identical to what went on with the Inquisition. You'd find out that communism and socialism with their militant atheist ideology have much more in common with the Inquisition than anything having to do with Christianity. And if you follow them historically, you can find a line from modern day communism and socialism all the way back to the Jesuits in the 19th century and the Inquisition from the Middle Ages and the Counter-Reformation. But that's a whole nother history. Um, so it's, it's important that we understand these things, that we understand history. Um, Karl Marx said, history is the battleground. History is the battleground. The Marxists understood 150 years ago that if you can change someone's perception of history and get them to believe a false version of history, then you can get them to make decisions today that will be in a certain direction. That's why we have the warning. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. George Orwell, who wrote the famous book 1984, now he had been a communist and then he turned away from communism because he realized how evil and depraved it was. Uh, but he warned people. He said, those who own the past will also own the future. Those who own the past will also own the future. You think about what's happening in America right now. Right now you have so many of these radicals, these leftist radicals who are out in the streets and they're yelling and shouting and screaming and all this other kind of stuff and they're stomping on the American flag and they're burning the flag and all this other kind of stuff. The reason these young people are doing it is because of what they are being taught in the schools and the colleges and the universities about our history. 
They're being taught, oh, America was founded by a bunch of white supremacists, a bunch of evil slave owners. That was the founding of America. They came over here and stole the land from the Indians and on and on and on. That's what they're being taught. Now, of course, they're not being given a balanced view of history at all. They're not being taught, for example, that our Christian forefathers came over here and they purchased land from the Indians. They actually sat down with them, made deals with them. I have a whole presentation on this where I talk about the Christian history of America. In fact, our next documentary is called The True Christian History of America. And I'll show you how uh, they have altered our history books and they've done this deliberately. Yesterday I talked about the history of Islam as it pertains to the slave trade and the fact that uh, whites, uh, Europeans did not go and kidnap blacks in Africa. When the Europeans went to Africa, they purchased the slaves from the Muslims, many of whom were black, from black and Arab Muslims. Then they also don't tell anybody about the white slave trade, the fact that you had these Muslim pirates that sailed up and down the coastlines of Europe, England, Scotland, Ireland, as far north as Iceland, and they kidnapped between one to two million Western European white people and brought them back to Africa and bought and sold them in the white slave trade for hundreds of years. They don't want you to know that history because then you would begin to realize, hey, wait a minute. Uh, our forefathers were a part of something that everybody was doing. Everybody was a part of this thing, but it was Christianity, it was Christian people who believed in the principles of freedom because of the Bible and because of the New Testament in particular. Really two things. In the Old Testament it says, if you kidnap somebody and enslave them, you are to be put to death. Slavery is clearly condemned. And two, because in the New Testament we're told that Christ came to set the captives free. That where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And that slavery is a picture of the bondage of sin. Christianity 101 is that when God sent Moses into the land of Egypt to draw out the children of Israel and deliver them from the house of bondage, from the slavery of Egypt, that this was a picture, a foreshadowing of how God would send Christ into the world to deliver mankind from the slavery of sin. And so Jesus says, if the Son of Man shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Many people don't know that during the American Revolution, that was one of the leading scriptures that was used by ministers during that time. But that's because of Christianity, brethren. That's because of our Christian faith and because of the teachings of the Bible. The Koran does not have any such teachings. Islam makes no apology for slavery, none whatsoever. So it's very interesting that the same people who are making all of these accusations against the Christian world, not just in our country, this is going on in Canada, it's going on in Great Britain. In fact, we're gonna be talking about uh, in this presentation and the next one, the decolonization movement and how it worked. I was over in England years ago and we were filming at the British Library for one of our films, A Lamp in the Dark, uh, The Untold History of the Bible. And we went to the British Library, we had an opportunity to interview some of the scholars there. And the guy, the tour guide, or really one of the curators there at the museum, he was our guide to show us where we could go film and set up lights and all that kind of stuff. He was a very nice guy, but he was a young guy in his late 20s. And I had been studying the history of England and the Reformation and so on, and just developed a lot of admiration for the English reformers and how they recovered the Bible and they translated it and laid down their lives and so on. And I was talking to him, talking to him about the history of England and about the blessings of uh, English colonialism, okay? English, British colonization. Because people don't realize how many great blessings have come upon mankind because of British colonization. And I was talking to him about this and he suddenly became very fearful. <laughs> he had kind of a fearful look. And he says, well, you know, here we're, 
we're, we're actually not encouraged to talk about that. We're, we're actually encouraged to sort of not see the colonial era as a good thing. That's why. And what I'm going to be talking to you about today is why that mentality exists over there. And it's all because of what they've been taught about history, how they have been taught history. All right, so let's get into our discussion here on Hitler's Jihad Part 3. Now, the full title of this presentation is Hitler's Jihad, the Socialist Plan for Islam to Conquer the West. Now, what happened through World War II and the end of World War II, you have the foundation of what would become modern terrorism with Islamic terrorism. We see these acts of terrorism going on all over the world. We've seen, seen them here in the United States. The most famous, of course, was 9-11. But where did it all begin? You can trace much of it to a program called Operation Werewolf in Germany set forth by the Nazis toward the end of the war. And what happened was toward the end of World War II as the Allies were closing in on Germany and the German army was being defeated and overcome, uh, the Nazis put together uh, a group of guerrilla units that they called werewolves. And here's one of the, uh, this is actually uh, the instruction manual that were given to the, or that were, uh, that, that gives the instructions that were employed by the Nazi werewolves during the war. I actually have a copy of this. Um, but you can see there, SS Werewolf. And here's a quote. A quote, in the autumn of 1944, the Nazis instigated a plan to establish active forces behind enemy lines as the Allies pushed through Germany. It was called Operation Werewolf. Now, Operation Werewolf was spearheaded by a man known as Otto Skorzeny. Otto Skorzeny, and here we see a couple of pictures of him. One, on the left-hand side, he's wearing his Nazi uniform. He was a Nazi colonel. He was in the SS. And then on the other side, you see him there smoking a cigarette, wearing civilian clothing. And the reason uh, I'm presenting this contrast is because Skorzeny, who was called, uh, who was a he became actually a very famous figure in the intelligence community, uh, and to a certain extent, he was a celebrity during and after the war. Uh, but he would go on to train commando forces all over the world after World War II, including US Special Forces, which we're gonna talk about. But Skorzeny, you see him there, he's got that long scar down one side of his face. His uh, Part of his story is that when he was a young man, he was a teenager, he was involved in fencing. And he, while he was in some kind of a duel with a fencing sword, uh, he was slashed ac across the cheek. And this left him with uh, this long scar that he was, uh, he was known for throughout his life. And of course, he was very proud of his scar because he said it taught him about being a fighter and about how not backing down, how to endure pain and to overcome it and go on and defeat your enemy. So he was never ashamed of his scar. Uh, Skorzeny is known as the father of modern jihad warfare. If you research him and you research the modern jihadis and all that they're doing, with their guerrilla type operations, blowing up subways, blowing up pizza parlors, uh, setting up roadside bombs, all the kind of stuff that they do was taught to them directly or indirectly by Skorzeny and his werewolf units at the end of the war. And here's a quote, American and British military intelligence labeled Skorzeny the most dangerous man in Europe. Now this of course was during uh, the period toward the end of the war where the Allies were trying to get complete control of Germany. And what happened was what was resisting them toward the end, Skorzeny would do all of these, you know, unconventional methods of warfare. Because up to that point in history, when armies battled, we've all seen the movies where you see like a big army comes over here and then another big army on the other side of the field, right? And they've got thousands and thousands of men and then they all come at each other on the battlefield, right? That's typically how countries fought each other. 
when they were in battle. And this continued. It's, it's uh, like if you just think about Braveheart and your Braveheart warriors with swords charging with their swords and shields at their enemy. Then you go to the British now. Now they've got firearms. This is the reason why the British would march in a line, right, with the redcoats, and they would take their rifles and stand there, and then they would ready, aim, fire, because this was traditional warfare. All right, so then you get into the 20th century. Now warfare is modified somewhat, and, uh, but you still have big armies with tanks now and guns and whatever on one side, <laughs> and then a big army over here, and if, if the Germans were coming your way, they would say, okay, the, the, the fourth battalion of the Nazi army or whatever is, is 10 miles away, right? And there's, they've got 10,000 men and they're coming our way, this kind of thing. That's the way warfare generally operated. Scorzani, if you study him, he is said to be the guy who really changed the game on modern warfare. And the reason why now you have countries that will not necessarily send in a big army, but they'll send in like a Navy SEAL team, or they'll send in uh, British Special Forces or some Special Forces unit where they've got five, 10, 12 guys, this kind of thing, that go in, a small band of men, and they have their machine guns or whatever, and they take out a target quickly, set a bomb, blow something up, go meet a helicopter, and then fly out. All of this was based upon the methods of warfare developed by Scorzani. He seemed to uh, really be, in many ways, like the father of modern, modern guerrilla warfare. Here's a picture of Scorzani meeting with Adolf Hitler. Uh, he was called, again, Hitler's favorite commando because he did during the war a number of daring operations. Uh, probably the most famous that he did was the rescue of Benito Mussolini in 1943. What happened was, as the Axis powers were losing the war, the government in Italy lost confidence in Il Duce, Mussolini. So he ended up being arrested by his own people, and they put him in a prison, like in this castle off out in the countryside. And Mussolini was a close friend of Hitler. And they were friends with each other and so on. And so Hitler decided to rescue Mussolini from his imprisonment. So he brought in Otto Scorzani. And he decided to have Scorzani uh, go and rescue Mussolini. So Scorzani comes up with this guerrilla type operation. They go in there, they rescue Mussolini, put him on a plane and fly him to Germany and rescued him. And then the German media had it all over the press and everything. And here you see Scorzani. He was a little bit of a celebrity. He's actually posing with Mussolini uh, because he liked all of this daring adventure type stuff that he was doing. He was very much into it. Scorzani is said to have also trained specifically Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat, who was the founder of the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization. And when you think about the kind of operations that the Palestinian terrorists carried out, where they would hijack airplanes, or they would, like uh, in the Olympics in the 1970s, where they kidnapped the Israeli Olympic team and then ended up killing all of its members and this kind of thing. Even the attacks on 9-11, the 9-11 attack. If you study Scorzani and his methods of warfare, he would do things like during the war, during the end of World War II, one of the things that he did was he had his German soldiers put on allied uniforms, like American uniforms, and they hijacked an American tank and they got behind enemy lines and they're coming toward the Allied forces who think that they're part of the Allies. And then they would open fire on them, right, and attack them suddenly and take them by surprise. This was the kind of warfare that Scorzani uh, employed. What's interesting is after the war, he was tried for war crimes by one of the war crimes uh, tribunals and the reason you know, when I first read about this, I thought that they were going to go after him because he was somehow or other involved with concentration camps or something like that. But that wasn't it at all. He, was, he seems to have been uh, a commando. Uh, but the reason they put him on trial was because of the operation where his men put on allied uniforms. 
because that was apparently against the rules of war. But it's considered a war crime if in warfare you put on the enemy uniform. And then supposedly you can be punished for that once the conflict is over. And uh, Scorzani had some kind of an argument or whatever, but uh, they found him not guilty and they let him go. But nevertheless, he trained Yasser Arafat. Here's a quote. This is from the Weekly Standard. More and more people are learning about what happened. Uh, quote, Nazi commando Otto Skorzeny trained thousands of Egyptians in guerrilla and desert warfare and even organized early Palestinian terrorist forays into Israel and the Gaza Strip in the mid-1950s. So Skorzeny, even after the war, you know, yesterday I was talking briefly about Operation Paperclip. In my next presentation later on today, I'm going to talk even more about Operation Paperclip. Uh, but there's a saying about Operation Paperclip. People say the Nazis never really lost the war. They just moved. That's what people will say. They didn't lose the war. They moved. Uh, or they've, and what I say is they lost the war, but they never gave up the fight. They continued fighting for what they were trying to achieve, which is the socialist form of totalitarian government uh, to dominate Europe. And I believe, of course, what they've done is they have chosen to adopt Islam because Islam is the closest thing to a totalitarian socialist system. That's why uh, they want to employ it. OK. So here's another quote. Uh, it says, the trail of training guerrilla warfare and subversive tactics started in Germany at the end of World War II, but it advanced into Egypt, South America, and even into the United States after the war with Skorzeny as a paid consultant. Eventually, it spread to Al-Qaeda through the efforts of Skorzeny and Yasser Arafat. Skorzeny was, in effect, a guerrilla warfare consultant for hire to whomever wanted his new tactical and creative ideas, including the United States Special Forces. And this seems to be what has gotten our country into trouble. Uh, it's what many people point to, because after the war, the Nazis, who were guilty of these terrible crimes against humanity, and that many people, most people believe, should have been judged for what they did, and condemned and then punished for it, because it went beyond the ordinary rules of war. What happened after the war, you had the United States, you had Great Britain, you had Russia, and other countries as well, who realized that the Nazis, through their scientific experiments in a lot of these camps and so on, uh, and other experiments with weaponry, because German engineers are very, very capable with things like rocket science and developing U-boats and different types of machine guns and super guns and all this other kind of stuff, the different allied powers wanted access to that information. And this is the reason why they were hiring uh, scientists and so on. And so after the war, Skorzeny, who was very, very clever as a commando, and this, his, his guerrilla style werewolf tactics, as he called them, were seen as a new type of warfare. And the Allies, the reason they called him the most dangerous man in Europe is because he terrorized. I mean, if you study the things that he did, there are episodes where the, the Allies were really rattled by Skorzeny and the things that he did, these surprise attacks and whatnot. They were rattled by him. It didn't stop the Allied invasion, but they recognized it as something valuable as an instrument of warfare. And that's why uh, they brought him in, and he was hired by people all over the world. Interestingly, Skorzeny became uh, a hitman for the Israelis. He actually went to work for Israel, a former Nazi. Here you've got a, this is a Jewish publication. It says, the strange case of a Nazi who became an Israeli hitman. And what happened was after the war, you got the Nazis going into different countries where they're finding refuge. A number of Nazi scientists went into Egypt and they developed a rocket and missile program in Egypt. And the reason the Egyptian government wanted them to develop this program was because they wanted 
to have rockets so they could shoot them at the Israelis and, and go bomb Israel. Well, the Mossad, which is the Israeli intelligence network, recognized that this is going to be a very bad thing. You know, this is going to be very dangerous uh, for Israel if you have these German scientists over there building rockets for the Egyptians. So they kept trying one thing after another. They were making anonymous phone calls to the German scientists threatening to kill them. Uh, they were sending threatening letters. They were doing everything they could to try and warn the German scientists, you better stop trying to develop this missile program for the Egyptians. And they couldn't figure anything out. But so the program kept going. So Skorzeny, he was on Simon Wiesenthal's list of Nazi war criminals who needed to be confronted. So the Mossad had him on a hit list to take him out. He was one of the guys they were going to go after. Uh, and the Mossad, remember, they had picked up Adolf Eichmann. Okay, when he was down in uh, Argentina, they kidnapped Eichmann, brought him back to Israel, put him on trial. He was ultimately condemned uh, and put to death for his crimes against the Nazis. Interestingly, Adolf Eichmann, I talked about it briefly last night, but Adolf Eichmann was a close friend of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Again, another Muslim. And so, anyway, so Skorzeny now, uh, they had Skorzeny on their hit list as one of the guys to take out. So the Mossad goes and they send a couple of agents to try and assassinate Skorzeny, but they decided instead to see if they could recruit him. And so they ended up having a meeting with him in which they said, we want you to help us put a stop to this Egyptian rocket program with these Nazi scientists. And he said, okay. He said, okay. He said, uh, listen, I don't want any money. He says, I just want you to take me off your hit list. Because they said to him, if we don't kill you now, the, the agents who came to, if we don't kill you now, somebody else will. It's just a matter of time. And Skorzeny knew that the Mossad was very effective and very deadly. And so he decided to make a deal with him. He said, I don't want any money, but I'll, I'll go after one of the chief scientists and I'll deal with him. And so he ends up going and finding one of the German scientists who was one of the lead scientists there in Egypt and he gets him in a secluded area and he assassinated him, he killed him. So this is what they mean when they say he became an Israeli hitman. Then as a result of killing this Nazi rocket scientist, the Egyptian program ultimately was shut down because now the, uh, the, the German scientists became fearful that they were all going to be killed if they continued with this program. So they shut it down. So Skorzeny, in a strange sort of way, is credited for this kind of thing. But historians and commentators have talked about this, and they said, well, at what cost? What was the cost of bringing in these Nazis into the Allied countries and embracing them now as friends, if you will, because they never gave up their philosophies. They never gave up their ideas about abortion and euthanasia and socialism and all this other kind of stuff. And there are many of us who believe that this is the reason why we have seen the steady rise of all these socialist principles since the end of the Second World War. All right, here is a book written about Skorzeny, called Skorzeny, Hitler's Commando by Glenn Infield. And he calls this the, the Skorzeny Syndrome. He says, terrorism, the Skorzeny Syndrome, is flourishing in the modern world, a reminder that Hitler and Nazism are still taking their toll more than three decades after the Third Reich collapsed. Okay, so when, when, you, when you hear these stories about modern terrorism, Remember, you can trace all of modern terrorism back to the Nazi era, very directly. And there's not a few people who believe this. Uh, this is an article from uh, International Policy Digest, and the article says, Otto Skorzeny, the Nazi who influenced ISIS. So they're crediting the work of ISIS, and of course, uh, if you study ISIS and what they did, their methods are very, very very similar. 
All right, and here's, a, here's just a line here from the article. It says, quote, the most feared nation in World War II was Nazi Germany. They had strategies incorporating new and refined tactics as well as a great arsenal of traditional high-quality weapons to fight a new type of warfare they invented to conquer their neighbors. This is the reason why the Nazis were seen, because many of the Allies believe the reason that they won is because they kind of ganged up on Germany. You know, Great Britain, the United States, and Russia all ganged up on Germany, and that Germany spread herself too thin, and that that's ultimately why she lost the war. Uh, but they still value, they, they saw with great value all of these innovations and new techniques and things like that that the Nazis had developed. All right, here's another quote from a, a book called Hitler's Legacy, or an article, Hitler's Legacy, the Scorzani Syndrome. It's the same article. Uh, so it says, quote, what the world has been experiencing since at least 2001 that's 9-11, has been what analysts refer to as asymmetrical warfare conducted by non-state actors. This is a technique that was developed to perfection by Scorzani. Asymmetrical warfare is essentially the idea that when you have a great country, okay, like a massive country like the British Empire or the United States of America or the Soviet Union, you have the, these big, massive countries with lots of power and lots of money and this kind of thing. Asymmetrical warfare is where you go in with small companies of men and you find ways to attack, terrorize, and destabilize these countries, okay? Because you can't meet them head on. You can't go in with an invading army and attack them in a full frontal assault. So you have to look for ways to attack them in little ways. Attack them in places where they're weak. Now I believe what they do is their tactics are not just acts of terrorism, but they get involved in education, they get involved in small government, they get involved in the schools, the colleges, they get involved in politics, they get involved in the media, they get involved in filmmaking, they look for these areas where they can gain access to power and then they work to become an influence in that way. And so they're conducting asymmetrical warfare at a variety of different levels to undermine and overthrow these countries from within. Now, yesterday, I talked about the decolonization movement and about how this began when Germany decided to weaponize Islam in all of the British and French colonies. To understand the effectiveness of what they did, they overturned more than 50 colonies from World War II all the way through the 20th century. And you study these colonies, these colonies are now countries so think about that. They've overturned roughly 50 countries or more that used to be under the British Empire that were overturned, overthrown, using these methods of asymmetrical warfare at a variety of different levels. And this is why many of us recognize what they're doing in the United States is essentially the same thing. It's just the reason that our country hasn't suffered the same fate is because of how big our country is. They're, they're not so able to get as many actors in our country, like the Muslim population in America is at about 1%. In many of these countries throughout the Middle East and the British colonies and so on, the Muslims were a much, much larger population. That's why they employed them there so effectively. But the reason I believe that they continue to pursue this program is because it has been very, very successful for them employing the principles of socialism and the principles of jihad has allowed them to overturn one country after another, after another, after another. In fact, we were talking last night after I gave my presentation, um, uh, one of the ladies came over and was talking to me. She had gone to a presentation with Brigitte Gabriel. Anybody here know who Brigitte Gabriel is? She shows up on Fox News all the time. She's a Lebanese Christian woman. 
uh, and she tells her story, what happened in her country of Lebanon, where she says uh, it was a Christian country in the Middle East, they had a Christian constitution, and they were a very successful country. They had a great economy, they had tourism, uh, it, 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 their capital city was called the Paris of the Middle East. It was very, very successful, but what happened was they were being drawn into these ideas of multiculturalism and inclusivism and, well, we don't want to be bigots and this kind of thing. And what did that mean? Well, that meant that they were having all of these Muslims moving into their country. And there was this buildup of the Muslim population. Now, they had a much smaller population. I think they had less than 5 million people there while this was going on. So when you have less than 5 million people in your country, it doesn't take that long to bring in several million foreigners who now are a substantial percentage of your population. They're now 20%, 30%, etc. Uh, and once the Muslims reached a certain percentage in Lebanon, they, ro they rose up and started a civil war. And this is what Brigitte Gabriel talks about. She talks about being a 10-year-old girl and laying in her bed in her home. And one day at night, a rocket hit her house and her roof blew up and collapsed. And she was buried under the rubble and had to be taken to a hospital. And then she says she and her family, for the next five years, I think she said, uh, were living in a bomb shelter because the Muslims had started a civil war in her country. And the civil war went on for about 15 years, if you study what happened in Lebanon. And so she believes, and many others believe, that the globalists, the socialists, using Islam as a weapon are effectively trying to do the same thing eventually here in the United States, that they're doing it in these countries in Western Europe, they just haven't taken them to that tipping point yet. Uh, and again, I think a lot of it has to do with their population size. Okay, now here's an article. Why did so many uh, wanted Nazis, that's hunted Nazis, convert to Islam? And after the war, you have like a whole list of these former Nazis that became Muslims after the war, okay? Uh, let me read part of this to you. Uh, the article says, there are Nazi graphs in Arab Islamic terrorism. At the top of the most wanted list of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, there is a man who today would be 100 years old. His name is Alois Br Brunner. He is responsible for the deaths of over 130,000 Jews. The Nazi hunters still place him in Syria, where he was last seen in 2001, protected by the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Brunner was one of the most zealous ideologues and officials of the final solution, the plan for the extermination of the Jews. The idea haunted him to the point that in 1985, he said to the German magazine Bunta, quote, I regret that I didn't finish the job. I regret that I didn't finish the job. Then it says, when the United Arab Republic of Syria was formed, Dr. Brunner took up residence uh, at 7 George Haddad in the embassy district of S Damascus. Okay. And uh, he is one of many uh, Nazis who converted to Islam. And uh, notice what he said. He, he was very much like Adolf Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann repeatedly told the Jewish people when he was on trial, they kidnapped him, taken him to Israel, and he's telling him that he sees them as his mortal enemy, that he was responsible for millions of them being put to death, and he had no remorse and no regret. That was his view, and that's the view of this Nazi that converted over to Islam. Uh, one of the more uh, famous Nazi converts was Johann von Leers, who died in 1965. He was a Nazi propaganda minister uh, who worked with Joseph Goebbels, who was the famous Nazi propagandist. Uh, but von Leers was a Nazi propaganda min minister who converted to Islam after the war and adopted the name Oman Amin von Leers. Oman Amin. Uh, but then he kept his last name, von Leers. Okay. Von Leers wrote to a friend after the war, after Germany lost the war. 
Here's what he said to a friend of his. He said, quote, Von Leers once wrote to a friend that, quote, if my nation had got Islam instead of Christianity, we should not have had all the traitors we had in World War II. Now, when he says, if my nation had got Islam instead of Christianity, what he's talking about, this is a reference to the view of Hitler. And I believe many of the Nazis, many of the Nazis who were adopting Islam back in the 1930s and 40s, as we talked about yesterday, and they were saying, Islam is the world power of tomorrow. Okay? If we had gotten Islam instead of Christianity, like it was just our luck of the draw, we got Christianity, the people on the other side of the world got Islam. That's what he's saying. And why? Because in the Muslim world, if you study Islam, the Muslims are unified, even though they have their divisions amongst themselves and they're fighting and killing each other quite often. Uh, when it comes to the infidel, the kuffar, the infidel, they are unified against the infidel. Most of them will be unified against the infidel. And this is what Von Leers is talking about. And he seems to be making reference to this view of Hitler, Hitler's view of Islam, where Hitler said essentially the same thing. He said, quote, you see, it's been our misfortune to have the wrong religion. The Mohammedan religion, which would have been much more compatible to us than Christianity, okay? Or the Muhammad would have been much more compatible. We should have been converted to Mohammedism, that cult which glorifies the heroism and which opens up the seventh heaven to the bold warrior alone. And Hitler, of course, uh, and then he says, then the Germanic races would have conquered the world. This is what many of the Nazis believed, that the problem was Christianity. And if you could just get rid of Christianity, replace it with more of a fierce warrior religion like Islam, then, you'd, then, then we could conquer the world. That was their view. Okay. Uh, here's an article from a Jewish publication called Mosaic. And they, uh, they review a book called Hitler's Religion. Sometimes people think that Hitler, they'll try to argue that Hitler was a Christian somehow or other. Or, or because he was Catholic, which he was. He was Catholic. Um, but here's what this article says. It says, quote, Hitler repeatedly affirmed the existence of God, but his conception of God differed substantially from the Bibles. He rejected Christ's divinity and frequently mocked Christianity. Hitler Weichart, Weichart, who's the author of this book, Hitler Weichart points out was a baptized, confirmed, confirmed Catholic <laughs> raised in Austria, a predominantly Catholic country, and he retained some vestiges of Christianity. Nevertheless, he repeatedly repudiated Christianity, especially privately, as, quote, a Jewish plot to undermine the heroic ideals of the Aryan-dominated Roman Empire. So he equated Christianity with Judaism, which is why those who have studied Hitler's philosophies believed that he hated Christianity as much as he hated Judaism and wanted to get rid of it. And isn't it interesting that the socialists in Europe and in the United States seem to be as opposed to Israel, the nation of Israel, and Christianity at the same time. They reject both. All right, this is an image of a painting, a famous painting called The Wild Hunt from 1889. Now, if you look at the painting, you're, you're looking at the pagan god Wotan. He's called Wotan is another name for Odin. Those of you who know the Marvel comic movies, uh, Thor, Thor's father is called Odin. This is old Norse mythology and so on. Well, the Germanic version of it, uh, you have Wotan instead of Odin. And Wotan, this is on the wild hunt. And so there's a legend about Odin or Wotan going out on a wild hunt and that it's, it's when the wild hunt happens that it's often an omen, an ill omen of something bad coming. Well, if you look at the picture of Wotan there, Wotan looks kind of like Adolf Hitler. If you look closely, 
The thing is, the painting was done back in 1889. Now, when Hitler came to power and the Holocaust happened, all this tragedy happened in Europe, there are many people who believed that the painter, Franz von Stuck, was somehow or other prophetically foretelling the rise of Hitler. Okay, that was the argument. But then historians discovered that that wasn't quite the case. That the, the real history is a little bit more interesting, I think. Uh, and that is that Hitler, it appears, deliberately tried to model his appearance after this painting of Wotan. And so here's uh, from uh, uh, a researcher, a historian on this says, quote, Hitler was very fond of Stuck's work, he's Stuck's the artist, of Stuck's work since his childhood. The Wild Hunt became his favorite painting at the age of 13 and remained a major source of inspiration even when he became known as the Fuhrer. He even acquired the original and kept it in his personal gallery. Many historians claim that Hitler modeled his appearance, his appearance and demeanor after Stuck's painted Wotan. He seems to have liked the idea of dressing and combining his hair like Stuck's artistic representation of the ancient Germanic god of war. And I believe that this is really behind Hitler and the Nazi thinking. They're thinking about Islam because the idea of the old Viking Nordic gods, Thor and Odin and all this other kind of stuff, is that when you're a Viking, you go in, you attack the villages, you rape the women, you grab the gold, you grab the treasure, you take slaves, and then you go back and you are now a great warrior because you conquered your enemies. Some people may even remember the band uh, Led Zeppelin from the 1970s, but they had a, uh, a song uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the song, but in part of the song they're singing about the Vikings. And they say, we are your overlords. And then they cry out, Valhalla, I am coming. Because if a warrior dies in battle, he dies and he goes straight to Valhalla while he's out raping and pillaging and so on. That's his reward. Well, the old savage barbaric Viking lore is nearly identical, if you study Islam, to what the Muslims believe to this day. They believe they've got to go around waging jihad. They get to rape women. They get to blow things up, kill people, cut people's heads off, uh, overturn countries, towns, and cities, and everything else, and wage jihad. And if they die in battle, then they go to Islamic paradise because they died as a brave warrior. That seems to be the connection between the Nazi worldview and the Islamic worldview. It's this savage, old, pagan worldview. And how many people have seen the series on the History Channel, The Vikings? Anybody see The Vikings series? A Couple of people have seen it. If you watch it, it's actually based on real history, some real history anyway, but how the Vikings basically started invading the Christian world in Western Europe and attacking all these Christian countries and pillaging them and plundering them. And eventually what happens is the Vikings are defeated uh, by, I think it's King Alfred, Alfred the Great, I think defeated the Vikings. And then what happens is the Vikings end up being converted to Christianity, okay? Which is why all the former Viking countries now uh, became Christian countries. Uh, but here's my thought on this. It's unfortunate that uh, many people believe that, you know, as Hitler did, Hitler believed that Christianity was a religion of slavery, whereas uh, Islam was a religion for warriors. But the reality is, in our own Christian history, brethren, and this is part of what we're going to get into in our next film, we actually have some very mighty warriors throughout history uh, that are a part of church history. Unfortunately, they're not taught in our history books, as they should be. Uh, here you've got two of my favorites. You have on the left side, you've got Oliver Cromwell, and on the right side, you've got John Ziska. Cromwell and Ziska. Now, Cromwell there on the left. Well, let me talk about Ziska first. Ziska is this one-eyed commander, and he's sitting on the horse, and he's got his mace. That's what he was known for. 
Ziska was the commander of the Hussites uh, back in the 15th century when the Council of Constance wrongly condemned John Hus and burnt him at the stake. And there was a big uprising of his followers who were called Hussites. And then the Holy Roman Emperor uh, was incensed because these people would dare to question the Council of Constance putting Jan Hus to death. And so what happens is uh, the, the Holy Roman Emperor, which was like the federal government back then, decides to invade Bohemia, which is the country of the Hussites. Well, then this one-eyed General Ziska, he rises up and he gathers together a bunch of Hussite farmers and they go out and they stop the invasion of the Holy Roman Emperor. They fought a total of 16 battles against the Holy Roman Emperor over a period of time. And they won every single battle. Ziska, if you study him, he was a Christian warrior. He called himself the warrior of God. He and his men would go out on the battlefield and they would take communion before the battle. But again, and they were followers of Jan Hus. Jan Hus is one of the famous um, reform preachers that preceded the Great Reformation a hundred years later. In fact, when Hus was being put to death, before he was put to death, he, he believed that God had told him that he was going to die, but that within a hundred years, God would raise up another preacher who would not be silenced. And in Europe, they believed that this was fulfilled with the ministry of Martin Luther and then the Great Reformation that followed. But you have Jan Hus, and then you have Oliver Cromwell. Uh, among the great Christian heroes of Europe, and England in particular, Cromwell is probably the most influential over the United States of America. In fact, um, Theodore Roosevelt wrote a biography of Cromwell in which he said basically that Cromwell's vision for a free government that he envisioned in England was not fully accomplished in England, but it was accomplished in the United States, much more so. And it's from Cromwell that we get the idea of God-given rights. Now you'll notice Cromwell in one hand, in his, what is that, his right hand, he has a sword, and in his left hand he's got a book. That book is the Bible. And one of the poems about Cromwell, Cromwell, the servant of the Lord, with his Bible and his sword. Because Cromwell believed, one, that as believers, as Jesus says, uh, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That was the Puritan belief. On Cromwell's tomb, there is the phrase, Christ, not man, is king. Christ, not man, is king. Because the Puritan belief was that God is almighty over all. The scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar. Romans chapter nine says, nay, O man, who are you that replies against God? So the Puritans believe that whether it has to do with the church or the state, that all have to submit to the commandments of God. And so this is why Cromwell and his Puritans, they overthrew King Charles I because he had betrayed the laws of England and he had betrayed the laws of God as well. And so you see him there with his Bible and his sword. In time, that same theme into America became the idea of the Bible and the gun. Okay? Uh, and so it's not surprising that uh, somebody like Barack Obama uh, would speak out against the Christian community and say that they cling, you know, to their religion and to their Bibles and their guns and this kind of thing. The whole idea of that of having the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit from Ephesians 6, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and then they would look to Romans chapter 13, Romans 13, which talks about government and the importance of government, and says that government is to operate as the minister of God. Government must be the minister of God. This is what our forefathers ultimately believed in the United States. It's what they believed at the time of the American Revolution. In fact, the great sermons, uh, one of the great sermons from Jonathan Mayhew uh, had to do with Romans 13 because sometimes Romans 13 was used because it says there is no higher power but of God. 
The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and so on. So some have used that as kind of a totalitarian scripture to insist that a Christian population must obey the government no matter what. In fact, this is said to have been one of Hitler's arguments in Nazi Germany, that you had to obey the government no matter what they told you to do. Well, that's not what the Bible tells us. Not what the Bible says at all. And uh, our forefathers who founded this country did not believe that. They believed that we submit to godly government, government that operates as the minister of God. That was their view. And I believe, brethren, on this whole issue of, of Islam, uh, in terms of what to do about it, I don't believe that secular humanism will be any match for Sharia law. Because secular humanism, once you understand it, is really designed as an open door for subversive groups to get in and to undermine your country. But see, our forefathers really did not set forth, if you study the Declaration of Independence and early American law, they did not set forth a secular humanist government. They believed that government had to operate according to the principles of God's law, as far as the moral framework of society. They believed theology was something separate, that was for the church, but that the state had the responsibility and the duty to govern according to God's law. And I believe that's something we should prayerfully consider as we go forward and see these things unfolding in our country and throughout the Western world to reclaim the heritage of our Christian forefathers that in many ways has been lost. But hopefully, with God's help, can be restored. All right, brethren, that's going to do it. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you guys. Welcome back. Too loud? Um, hope everybody had a good supper. Two more presentations tonight. And uh, Chris is next up. And I, I just want to again say to you folks, because I know that a lot of you made a sacrifice to be here. You drove a long ways. And it wasn't convenient. Um, so thank you. And we do appreciate the financial support that you help us with. And uh, hanging in there, because I know a lot, of you, a lot of you have been here as many hours as I have. And um, it's long. But I don't know any other better way to do it. You know, we could maybe have four talks this week and four the week after. And, but that, <laughs> that's not possible. At any rate, uh, welcome back. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to bring Chris up for his presentation. And um, I'm going to let him open the session with prayer. Thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you. All right. We are going to continue here with this saga concerning Western civilization. But let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you again and we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy toward us. We thank you, Lord, above all, for the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you'll be with us tonight. Help us, Lord. Guide us by the power of the Holy Ghost and grant us wisdom and understanding and learning, Lord so that we may have knowledge and wisdom to serve you and to shine a light to others. Please, Lord, be with this presentation tonight. I pray it will be a blessing to all those who hear it and who see it. We ask it and pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so Hitler's Jihad Part 4. Hitler's Jihad Part 4. Again, for those who have not necessarily been following uh, with this a four, four part series that I have been presenting on. Uh, the reason that, that I specifically call it Hitler's Jihad is because of a belief that part of the reason why we are seeing the massive flow of Muslims into the Western world 
uh, stems from the philosophy that Hitler had that Christianity, and that they, there's even a, uh, there's at least one, one segment of the History Channel where they did a documentary on this that talked about the relationship between Hitler and the Grand Mufti. And there's a lot of very interesting uh, information there where they talk about the Mufti and they talk about in that uh, presentation how Hitler believed that Christianity was a religion of slavery and Islam was a religion for warriors. And of course, I talked about in the last presentation how that's really not the case. Some of the greatest uh, and, and most invincible warriors in history uh, have been Christian warriors, have been God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians. Uh, I mentioned uh, Jan Hus uh, and how he was burnt at the stake. And then you had the great Hussite commander, uh, John Ziska, this one-eyed general. If you look up General Ziska, he is revered in the Czech Republic, I think it is. The Czech Republic is modern-day Bohemia. Uh, but he's revered to this day. They have monuments to him and so on. And he is known because he was undefeated in battle. He fought, he was like a real, real live Braveheart type warrior, but he was a convicted Christian, a Bible believing Christian, and he did not lose. He won every battle. And I believe he was trusting in the promises that God gives in the Bible. Same thing with Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell was undefeated. Here was a man, Cromwell, who had no military training or experience, and yet he put together what was called the New Model Army. And Cromwell had said specifically, he had said he saw what was happening there in England, and he saw the uh, uh, the lords, the barons who were trying to resist the king. It wasn't going very well. And he said, there's a problem with the army. You've just got the wrong kind of men. And he says, I'm going to put together an army of men who have the fear of God before their eyes. Men who bring some conscience to what they do. Give me such an army, he said, and I promise you they will not be beaten. And so Cromwell focused on a soldier's virtue. In fact, his uh, soldiers, you can find online the Christian soldier's Bible. Christian Soldier's Pocket Bible, it's called. And it is said to be the abbreviated, it's really not a Bible, what it is, is a collection of scriptures uh, that pertain to warriors and warfare and trusting in God for victory. And remembering that the scripture says, the horse is prepared for battle, but victory comes from the Lord. And so Cromwell's soldiers were said to keep this in their breast pocket as they went into battle. And they went into battle singing psalms just like they read about in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, the armies of Israel would go into battle uh, singing psalms and praise to God. In fact, it was the Puritan Ironsides who served with Cromwell. And remember, he had people who were serving with him, men like John Milton, Milton who wrote Paradise Lost, very famous uh, Paradise Lost. Uh, Milton called Cromwell our chief of men, he said. Uh, John Bunyan, John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progre Progress, Pilgrim's Progress, one, said to be by many people, even Charles Spurgeon said, outside the Bible, the greatest piece of Christian literature is Pilgrim's Progress. There are many, many uh, great historic churchmen who have held that view, but John Bunyan, who wrote that work, served in Cromwell's new model army, okay? They were the ones who developed the phrase, no king but King Jesus. We serve no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. That was their motto. That motto was then adopted in the American colonies. Some of you may have heard that. Anybody ever heard that motto before? Uh, that motto began with Cromwell and his Ironsides. In fact, interestingly, here in the United States, we had one of our battleships from the 19th century. The USS Constitution was called Old Ironsides, and it was named for Cromwell and his Puritans. It was a battleship that was undefeated in battle. And so you have a number of these warriors. Another one, Gustavus Adolphus, the great king of Sweden, 
uh, it's so tragic to me. I was talking earlier, I, you know, during the break, I was talking to a brother uh, about the situation that's going on in Western Europe right now and how tragic it is in Sweden that Sweden is being overrun by Islam. The socialists there are bringing in more and more Muslims. The women are being victimized. The women and children are being victimized. Uh, Sweden is being called the rape capital of Europe repeatedly. Some have called it the rape capital of the world. And here is a country where the king of Sweden centuries ago put his life on the line for the gospel, his life and his kingdom during the 30 years war because the Jesuits were trying to stamp out the preaching of the gospel and they were gonna destroy all the Protestants in Europe if they could. And uh, the great king Gustavus Adolphus, he went forth with his army and he said he knew he was taking a risk. He knew he was risk, risking his throne and his kingdom, but he could not sit by and watch his fellow Christians persecuted and killed. And he did not want to see the light of the gospel diminished. He, he wanted to see and to protect the free preaching of the gospel. So uh, he was undefeated in battle. And even in his last battle, Adolphus was killed. He died but his army won the battle. They won the battle. And I always thought that was a beautiful picture of uh, the death of Christ on the cross. He died on the cross, but in his death, he triumphed over his enemies. Praise the Lord. So there are some great Christian warriors throughout history. It's interesting, but um, uh, there's been some press about General Patton recently. And they talk about General Patton there are those who believe that Patton was assassinated. General Patton was assassinated by our own OSS, which is going to mean more as we go forward in this presentation. And part of the reason, I think, has to do with corruption that was going on in this country from the era of the Second World War. But Patton was a God-fearing man. He had been raised in a Christian home and there is a, uh, you know, a very famous event that happened where they were traveling across Europe, fighting their enemies and so on, and Patton called for a prayer, called for the chaplain to write out a prayer so that they could pray and that he commanded all the troops to pray and cry out to God to grant them victory. Uh, it's a very interesting contrast when you see Patton on the, the Allied side of the war, and then in contrast, you've got Hitler on the other side looking down on Christianity, insulting Christianity, calling it a religion of slavery, uh, saying that it's weak, it's flabby, it's no good for us. It's unfortunate, he said, that we got the wrong religion and that Islam would have been much better suited for Germanic peoples and if they had been converted to Islam, then they could have gone and conquered the rest of the world through the Islamic religion. Is it possible? I ask the question. I believe there's a lot of evidence of this because you had many German writers, as I said earlier. I just want to say this again for anybody who didn't see my earlier presentations. You have uh, German intellectuals. You had Nazi journalists and so on publishing material. They published a work called All Islam. All Islam, exclamation point, world power of tomorrow. The world power of tomorrow. And they're writing this back in the 1930s. Did they have a long range plan even back then to transform Western civilization, to replace what they're calling right now? I mean, you can go on the internet, type in the words, the great replacement. Just go type in those words, the Great Replacement, and you see all the websites that come up. One country after another, Canada, England, uh, the countries of Western Europe, over and over and over again, they use that phrase, the Great Replacement. Why? Because of all these immigrants, these Muslim immigrants that are being brought in. And some people think that it is some kind of racial replacement that they're replacing Europeans with Arabs and this kind of thing. I don't believe it's as much about race. I believe it has much more to do with trying to replace Christianity with Islam. This is much more of a spiritual conflict 
and it has to do with hatred against Christianity. But as the Lord says, do not marvel if the world hates you. The world hated me before it hated you, the Lord says. So Jesus said that we would be hated by all men for his name's sake, hated of all men for the sake of the Lord. All right, so we talked about in the previous presentations how uh, Germany began to weaponize the Muslim world through World War I and World War II. They began to weaponize the Muslim world and stir up Muslims against the Christian colonies, the British colonies primarily, but also the French colonies. I mentioned before about Brigitte Gabriel. Brigitte Gabriel came from Lebanon, the country of Lebanon, which was a very successful Christian country back in the 1970s and so on, had been under the authority of France. It was under a, uh, a French mandate. It was very similar to a French colony. But then once this decolonization movement began, largely at the instigation of the Axis powers, largely at the instigation of Germany and the Nazis, uh, working through the Muslims. And again, there were more things to it than just Islam, but Islam played a major role because they had such a huge population. This began this whole decolonization movement. And very, very rapidly, from the 1930s and 40s all the way through the 1960s and 70s, you saw the decline and fall. You see here just a couple of books on the decline and fall of the British Empire, the rise and fall of the British Empire, OK? And so then you have the effects of decolonization. This is a political cartoon where you see uh, a number of characters standing there, and they're holding up signs that say, British clear out and free India from British tyranny and all this other kind of stuff. Let's get rid of Britain. And then the people are looking around, and there's this desolate wasteland. There's mayhem. There's chaos. There's crime. There's dead bodies everywhere. Why? Because, in a sense, this has been the tragedy of decolonization. Decolonization has led to the decline of many parts of the world that have been given over now. Many of them, not all, but many of them have been given over to this radical Islamic fundamentalism and the reinstatement of Sharia in many places. And then, of course, accelerated persecution against Christians. And it's why we're constantly hearing stories in the news about churches being burned down, about Christians being raped, robbed, murdered, enslaved, et cetera, in all of these different countries around the world. There's a website called thereligionofpeace.com, thereligionofpeace.com. If you go to that website, they have been documenting the Islamic terror attacks from 2001 right up to the present day, okay, since 9-11. If you go to that website, and you go back, what they do is they do like a weekly jihad report, then they do a monthly jihad report, and they tell you how many terror attacks, and the way they're defining terror attacks in general is uh, if you have Muslims who are shouting Allah Akbar, and they attack somebody and kill them, or they blow up a bomb, or they stab somebody, or something. But it's specifically an attack on behalf of Islamic Jihad. For the past several years, there have been an average of about a thousand Jihad attacks every month, according to this website. And what they're doing is they're gathering the stories from media outlets all over the world. Not just, and the, the vast majority of the things that are happening out there, probably 90, 95% of it, is not being reported in our mainstream news. Mainstream news reports only if there's an attack in England or in Paris or Canada or someplace, someplace that typically gets a lot of attention. But these more remote countries where they have terror attacks, I mean, there was a, an attack now in Nigeria that happened where there were about a dozen Christian villages that were besieged by the Muslims. Nigeria that used to be under the British Empire no longer 
no longer. They used to have a Christian leadership there in that country. Nigeria used to be a Christian country, dominated by Christianity. Now, about half the country is Muslim. And when Barack Obama was in office, Obama went out of his way to have the Christian leader removed from power and to have this radical Islamic uh, military commander installed as the new president. And now what they're saying, what's being reported, is that Christians are being persecuted at an accelerated rate and the government will not protect them. They won't defend them. And so their, their villages are being ravaged and this kind of thing, they're being slaughtered, uh, and there's no government protection. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk about is why these things are happening in the Western world. Why did this happen in the 20th century? And I think there's, well, there's a number of reasons why, a number of things factor in. There's two big reasons, in my opinion, uh, the two major reasons. If we read the Bible and we study the book of Judges, I personally believe that the book of Judges should be studied in our high schools, at least. It ought to be studied in the high schools. Every American ought to be required to study the book of Judges. because What you find in the book of Judges is the principle that our forefathers believed. Uh, William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, once said that if men will not be governed by God, they will be ruled by tyrants. That's the choice. And that's what we find in the book of Judges. Over and over and over again, the children of Israel, they trust God and they're blessed and things are going well for them. Then they turn away from God. They stop obeying God's commands. They worship other gods and so on. And then they are delivered into the hands of their enemies. Their enemies come upon them and oppress them. Then they cry out to God and then God raises up a judge and the judge overthrows their enemies and then they have a time of peace and rest. But then they rebel again and they turn away from God and they start worshiping false gods, etc. And then their enemies come upon them and oppress them. And this happens over and over and over and over again throughout the book of Judges. And that's why I think it's such an important lesson. It's a very short book. But our forefathers understood the principle. They understood the principle. Patrick Henry once said, when a people forget God, that's when tyrants forge their chains. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was a Christian man, a Russian, and he lived through the Soviet Union, and he spent years of his life in a Soviet gulag. And he said that when he was a child and he saw all the devastation of the, uh, the communist revolution there, that happened and devastated so many lives that he heard one of the old people say, men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. And then he spent years of his life, he said, researching and studying the revolution, Marxism, all of the elements that went into it. And he said, after all his years of research, he could not find a better answer than what he had heard as a young boy. Men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. And Solzhenitsyn, he's very interesting. He talks about how there was a generation that was dedicated to militant atheism throughout Russia, trying to stamp out Christianity, stamp out the Bible, stamp out faith in God from their institutions and so on, and that that laid the groundwork, he said, for communism that would come in and seize control of that country in the 20th century. Now, why would this happen to Great Britain, the British Empire? Think about this now. The empire about which it was said, upon which the sun never set. Why would you have this fall, this dramatic fall of the British Empire? Well, I think one of the reasons would be Darwin's theory of evolution. We've been listening to these great presentations from Jay uh, he's been talking about evolution, the importance of defending the authority of God as our creator. You have in the book of Revelation, the angel flying through the heavens, and he's preaching the everlasting gospel, and he says, fear God and give glory to him 
who made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. God is our creator. And the fact that God is our creator, that over and over and over and over again, God states and he restates in the scripture, that is the cornerstone of acknowledging his authority. That the Lord, he has made us and not we ourselves. But then Darwin's theory of evolution comes in in the year 1859, and now this comes about in England. And where is Darwin's body buried? Inside Westminster Abbey. I heard somebody said it. Somebody else knows. Westminster Abbey. What it, Westminster Abbey that represented the headquarters of English Reformed Christianity. And there they give a place of honor to a man who denied the very foundation of Christianity itself, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, undermining the authority of the Bible, because if Darwin is right, not only is the Bible wrong, but then the gospel is wrong. And the atheists know this. The atheists have even written about this. They say, if you remove the story of Adam and Eve, and you remove original sin, the fact that sin entered into the world, he says then the entire purpose of the death of Christ on the cross comes to nothing. It, it, comes to, it undermines the entire gospel message. So the gospel itself is undermined by the theory of evolution. All right, so you have the theory of evolution, 1859. Then this is one of our audio CDs called the Critical Text Controversy. You have the critical text of 1881. I've always found it very interesting that 1859, that's when Darwin published his theory of evolution, origin of the species, and that same year, that's the same year that Tischendorf discovered the Codex Sinaiticus, the New Testament portion, the portion that ultimately would turn the world of biblical scholarship upside down. And then you have the critical text theory that comes in in 1881. In my opinion, and I've made a number of documentaries on this, I talk about this extensively in this audio CD, and in fact, I've given presentations here at Fargo on this. The critical text, the problem with the critical text is the critical text, if you believe the critical text theory that was engineered by Westcott and Hort, who, by the way, were Darwinists. They believed Darwin. They did not believe that Genesis gave a literal account of creation. But if you believe the critical text theory, the conclusion that you will come to at the end of it is that the Bible simply cannot be the inspired inerrant word of God. That's the problem. And so you have these two components at work undermining the authority of God in the British Empire. And both of these things happen in Great Britain. Both of them happen in Great Britain. In fact, Westcott and Hort had on their committee, they had a Unitarian who sat on the committee. And uh, he was, and the Unitarians, of course, do not believe the gospel. They don't believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They reject the divinity of Christ. They don't believe it. And they also don't believe that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God. There was a big uproar when that came out, that that happened back in the 19th century. And uh, there was a friend, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, a good friend of Dean John Bergen. We talk about this in uh, Bridge to Babylon, if you see Bridge to Babylon, uh, who said that he was just grieved that the scriptures had been thus handled. And he said, how can we ever trust this translation, the work of Westcott and Hort? He says, will we not suspect the hand of heresy upon every page? Will we not suspect the hand? And that was a phrase he used, the hand of heresy. I even did a radio show on that, which you can find online. I called it the hand of heresy. Because from then, right up to this very day, there have been uh, conflicts and debates and so on within the uh, Christian community over the modern translations of the Bible. And it sowed a lot of discord and division among Christians. 
And if you study what they're doing, teaching the critical text in the colleges and the universities, et cetera, it is why one institution after another after another is abandoning the idea of inerrancy. They're just abandoning it. And we talk about this whole history. That's the cover for our film, Bridge to Babylon. Lots and lots of details, lots of history there. Now, I think what this comes down to, and I've talked about this before, what this comes down to is it's, it has to do with the authority of the Word of God. If you don't, as the Bible says, if the foundations be removed, what can the righteous do? The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus said, if any man hears my word and does not believe, I will not judge him, but he has one that will. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him on the last day. But how can we be judged by the word of God and by the words of Jesus Christ if we don't know what those words are? But of course we have the Lord's promise. Heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away. So, of course, I don't believe that the word of God has passed away. I don't believe that we've lost the words of Jesus Christ. However, here we have Daniel B. Wallace. Daniel B. Wallace, out of Dallas Theological Seminary, Daniel B. Wallace is considered a conservative Bible critic. He's considered conservative. I think that's very important. He is not seen as a liberal left wing. That's not how he's seen. He's seen as a conservative defender of the Bible. He has an article online called 15 Myths About Bible Translation. <coughs> 15 Myths About Bible Translation. Myth number 14. Here is the myth. The myth, according to Dr. Wallace, is, quote, red letter editions of the Bible highlight the exact words of Jesus. That's the myth. Supposedly, that's not true. They don't really highlight the exact words of Jesus. Why? Here's what he says. He says, quote, scholars are not sure of the exact words of Jesus. Ancient historians were concerned to get the gist of what someone said, but not necessarily the exact wording. In truth, though red letter editions of the Bible may give comfort to believers that they have the very words of Jesus in every instance, this is a false comfort. Okay? So according to Dr. Wallace now, <clears throat> if you believe when you're reading your Bible that you have the exact words of Jesus, this is supposedly a false comfort. And this is exactly what's being taught in the colleges and seminaries. Well, how can people believe that the Bible is the word of God if this testimony is true? And it's a very, very different testimony from what the reformers gave, from what men like Charles Spurgeon gave. In fact, uh, go read, there's a great sermon from uh, Spurgeon online called The Greatest Fight in the World. And he says, you should believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Believe it with all your heart. And he warned about the critics back in the 19th century that if every time you're reading the Bible, you have to go down and ask a Bible critic whether or not it's okay for you to believe this verse or that verse or this other verse. Is this verse reliable, etc.? Spurgeon said, they will rob us of all that we hold dear. They'll rob us of all that we hold. You won't be able to trust anything. All right, now I showed you the conservative Protestant evangelical who says scholars are not sure of the exact words of Jesus. Now, I gave my presentation here last time, or I think it was two years ago, I want to say, on Bridge to Babylon, parts one, two, three, and four, talking about the Bible. I give the presentation here. Then I go back home, and within a few weeks, I ran across this story on the internet. This is on Breitbart News, okay? Dan Wallace says scholars are not sure of the exact words of Jesus. Then this story shows up on Breit Breitbart. Quote, Jesuit Superior General 
we don't know what Jesus really said. Jesuit Superior General. Now, if, you, if anybody's seen my film series on the history of the Bible, you know that we spend a lot of time talking about the Vatican and the role of the Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation and how biblical criticism and skepticism, the idea of trying to convince people that the Bible is full of errors and because it's got so many mistakes in it and all this other kind of stuff, you can't trust that it's really the word of God. This was a movement initiated by the Jesuits as part of the Counter-Reformation. Because what they were doing is they were fighting against the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura, only the scriptures. And they wanted to overturn that doctrine because that doctrine is part of what inspired the Reformation. Because they argued, as the apostles said, they said to the Pope, when the Pope disagreed with the word of God, they said, well, we're going to go with the word of God. And they followed the example of the apostles who said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And if they were teaching real history in our schools, they would also teach that not only did this bring about a great reformation theologically for the churches, it also brought about a great reform politically and led to the development of the free world. How many people know that when Samuel Adams signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, he said, I trust that from this day forward, the reign of political Protestantism shall commence in America. How many people have heard that? Nobody. Nobody here. The reign of political Protestantism, why? Because he understood the Declaration of Independence as being a political Protestant doctrine based on the principles of the Great Reformation that rights come from God based upon God's law and that God is supreme over all. All right, now, oh, here's a quote from this article. Uh, the article says, quote, in a strangely convoluted interview, the new superior general of the Jesuit order suggested that different interpretations of the Bible can all be valid since no one really knows what Jesus said anyway. That's what they say. So all the different, whatever it says, they can all be valid because nobody really knows what Jesus said anyway. These would be the chief reasons why, I believe, you had the fall of the British Empire because these things were instigated in the decades just prior to World War I and World War II. And usually the Lord grants a time of repentance. If you, you read in... Um, uh, the book of Revelation where Jezebel is concerned and she's got these false teachings and so on and Jesus says I gave her space to repent but she repented not and then judgment fell I believe this will be my interpretation of history that these things were entered in in the 19th century by Great Britain that had a devastating impact spiritually and theologically on the Christian world and there was no repentance they continued with them. And then you had the British Empire just collapse after World War II. All right, now my recommendation for people who want to learn more about the critical text from a modern scholar, the, the guy that everybody goes to from the 19th century is Dr. Dean John Bergen. You see a lot of people make reference to Bergen. Dr. Wilbur Pickering is a great, great resource in my opinion uh, for understanding the critical text in modern times and why it's important to oppose it and resist it and to believe the traditional text of the Bible, okay? The traditional Greek text, the received text that goes back to the Reformation and was considered the word of God for hundreds and hundreds of years. Okay, all right, now here's what he says. Here's just a couple of views, just a couple of quotes from uh, Dr. Pickering just to give you an understanding of, of his take on this. The critical, I call it the critical text dilemma. He says, quote, a cursory view of the writings of textual scholars suggests that even the same scholars will vacillate as demonstrated by the more than 500 changes introduced into the third edition of the Greek text produced by the United Bible Societies. All right, now what he's talking about here is the Greek text 
used by the United Bible Societies is the same as what they call the Nestle Holland Greek. Essentially, it's all the same thing. It's the Greek that they use for modern Bibles. And when you have people say, well, in the Greek it says this, or the Greek it says that, or it's not consistent, or it's unclear, or whatever, typically what they're talking about is the critical text, the critical text Greek. And we explain all this in great detail. But he says they have 500 changes from one edition to the next, okay, produced by the United Bible Societies as compared with the second edition. And then he says the same committee of five scholars prepared both. So it was the same people. And they did two editions and they had 500 changes. He goes on to say that you get the idea that they're simply guessing. They don't know. And they admit that they don't know about these assertions. The problem is that this, these are the materials that they're teaching in our Bible colleges and universities. They're teaching all of this uncertainty. Then he goes on to describe even further. He says, uh, quote, even where there is unanimous testimony for the wording of a text, the canons of internal evidence do not preclude the possibility that the unanimous testimony might be wrong. He says, once internal evidence is accepted as the way to determine the text, no part of the text is safe. A new papyrus may come to light tomorrow with new variants to challenge the unanimous witness of the rest and so on. In other words, what he's saying is, I mean, we've got about five to 6,000 manuscripts of the New Testament in Greek from the ancient world. So what he's saying is, even if you've got 5,000 manuscripts that are unanimous, they all say the same thing, based upon the rules that they've set up for textual criticism, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Even if all 5,000 say the same thing, because tomorrow they could dig up from the sands of Egypt a papyri somewhere that has an alternative reading, and then that could change your view of these 5,000 manuscripts. See what I'm saying? Because that's how they explain it. That's their theory. That's their argument. So this is why Dr. Pickering says no text of the scripture is safe. Any text could be overturned at any moment if they just find another manuscript somewhere or another fragment or another papyri. Because that's how they handle the text. And so what I argue against in my films is the critical text theory because it puts what I call the perpetual question mark on the Bible. And I believe what it is is really a modern manifestation of what the serpent says in Genesis, yea, hath God said. Just constantly questioning. Can you believe? You can't believe this. You can't believe that. This verse is wrong. That verse. And just so we understand, folks, brothers and sisters, what we're talking about, we're talking about things like the last 12 verses of Mark. You're talking about the story of the woman taken in adultery, uh, where Jesus says, he among you who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. You're talking about Luke chapter 23, where Jesus is on the cross, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You're talking about these elements, these scriptures, and, and a number of others. I was uh, having a conversation with a brother yesterday, and I said, think about this. People grow up in this country, and there are people who don't know a whole lot about the Bible, but many of them have heard the story of the woman taken in adultery and how Jesus had mercy. They were getting ready to stone her, and Jesus had mercy upon her and said, he among you who's without sin, let him cast the first stone. Most people know that story. Most people have heard, they saw a movie, you know, a, a, uh, a reenactment, a Hollywood reenactment of the uh, New Testament, and they've heard the verse, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now imagine people grown up their whole life long, and they've heard these things for years. Then they're 25, 30 years old, and they hear somebody like a Dan Wallace, who's an expert on the Bible, supposedly, or a James White, who's also considered to be an expert in certain circles, because both of those men believe those verses 
are wrong, that those verses do not belong in the New Testament. I was surprised to find out that James White held to that view, and then I stumbled upon a radio show where he's actually talking about uh, Luke 23 and his view that when Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, that's not part of the original text. And it just has a catastrophic, a devastating impact on people's faith. So I believe those are the, the two major reasons why we've seen the fall of the British Empire, why we've seen the decline of Western civilization. It all comes back to faith in God. If our foundation is corrupted, if it's uncertain, as the Bible says, if the foundation be removed, what can the righteous do? And you have a scripture where David says in the Old Testament, it is time for thee, O Lord, to act, for they have made void thy law. For they have made void thy law. All right. All right, so now back to what's happening in Western civilization. Western civilization, Europe being invaded by Islam. Why is this happening? I believe it's spiritual, brethren, ultimately. But these are the politics of it. Here's a couple of works. One, Hasta la Vista, Europe. The subtitle says, what you're not being told about the refugee crisis and how it's destroying Europe. Because the media, there's no question, the media is going to great lengths to cover up the catastrophic impact of all of these immigrants flooding in. And that it's having a devastating daily impact. Uh, there's another book, I, I remember when I saw the title, I had to do a radio show on it, called The Strange Death of Europe. The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, Islam. Immigration, Identity, and Islam. Why are they trying to replace? And what you've got now in Europe especially, you have uh, many churches, it is said, that are in decline. They're being turned down and churches are being converted into mosques. Churches being converted into mosques. More and more. Isaiah chapter 1, I went over this yesterday. Isaiah chapter 1 says, your country is desolate. This is God reproving the children of Israel because of their sins, because they've turned away from the Lord. And God says to them, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Right now, this is the chief complaint of many patriots in all these different countries. And these are historically Christian countries. These are the countries that were called for many centuries the lands of Christendom. That's how they were seen. Now they're being undermined. And you have two enemies. You have the socialists that I believe have continued their legacy uh, from Nazi Germany right into modern times. We're going to talk more about the socialists and then the jihadis, the Muslims, who are the ancient enemies of Christendom, the ancient enemies of the Christian world for 1,400 years. And for those who may not have seen my earlier presentations, in the, in the very first presentation, I took time to talk about the repeated attempts throughout history for the Muslim world to invade Western civilization, Western Europe, and take it over. This is not a new phenomenon. The Muslims have been trying to do this for more than a thousand years. Now the new element is they're being helped by what I call the Judas Iscariot coalition. You have these traitors who are betraying the Christian world. And they're operating in governments, schools, colleges, universities, at every level at this point. All right, so I thought this was a very powerful verse in Isaiah chapter 1. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire. Here's France. France has tens of thousands of cars that are set on fire every year, it is said, by these Muslim migrants. They're just setting their cities ablaze. There were said to be this past New Year's Eve, 
more than a thousand cars just on New Year's Eve were set on fire, New Year's Eve in France. And the media, it is said, covers this up because most of the people setting these fires are these Muslim migrants. All right? We've had our own problems here in the United States, although we don't really have as big a problem with Islam that they're having in Western Europe. Uh, but still, we've seen things like Berkeley, California, where these radical leftists at Berkeley uh, didn't want to hear any conservative speaking going on, and they had a riot there and set the place on fire at one point. We've had events like Ferguson, Missouri, where literally in uh, uh, a leftist rage uh, over law enforcement, uh, they threatened to burn the city down. Again, I don't think the situation here in the United States is yet as bad as what's going on in Europe. But we have so many voices that are warning us that what's happening in Western Europe, the globalists, the elitists, they have the same plan for the United States. Now, here's something, because we're, we're all seeing this happen. Uh, I've done uh, quite a bit of research into the history of the Second Amendment. Many people don't realize that the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, is also a result of the great Protestant Reformation. But here, let's look at this story. This is from the uh, Charlie Hebdo attack in 2015. Some of you may remember, this was a magazine over there in uh, France, in Paris. Here's the headline, unarmed police officers forced to flee as armed terrorists attack. They have gun control on steroids in France. I mean, it is massive gun control. Total socialist, leftist, nobody has a gun. It is so bad, many of their police officers, apparently, I did not know this until this story, but apparently the, many of their police officers don't carry guns. And so here you had this tragic scene where you had two jihadi thugs with AK-47s, they had guns, and the police don't have a gun. And this was the tragic scene a few years ago where you have a police officer cowering on the ground, unarmed, and moments after this picture was shot, he ends up being killed by that jihadi because he's unarmed. He's unarmed. And it, you know, it's straight, it's almost like a picture of what's happening to Europe overall. The jihadis are coming in, they're armed with Sharia law, and they're armed with their jihad. And the Christians, I think even worse than giving up your real gun, giving up your real sword, is to give up the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Because one has everything to do with the other. It's not just about guns, really. It's not just about, the jihadis have guns, but they don't have Bibles. They have the Koran. The Bible tells us what to do with the gun. But I think part of the important history we need to reclaim is the fact that the right to keep and bear arms was developed by our Christian forefathers. And the reason it was developed, brethren, was specifically because of all the massacres that happened against Christians in the Middle Ages. Or I should say probably post-Reformation, that would be more accurate in terms of the time frame. But it was things like the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, the Massacre of the Waldenses in 1655, the Irish Rebellion of 1641, where uh, a reported 100 to 150,000 Protestants were mass murdered in Northern Ireland. You had one massacre after another after another. And as a result, in 1688, with the Glorious Revolution, what brought that on, the Glorious Revolution of 1688, Part of it was King James II, who was Catholic, was disarming the Protestant population. But he was keeping guns in the hands of the Catholics. And all the Protestants thought, well, we're about to get slaughtered. Because they'd seen it happen over and over again. So they wrote letters to William and Mary, William of Orange and his wife Mary. Mary was an heir to the throne of England. And they said, come and invade England. William has betrayed us. We're not going to fight for him, but we'll fight for you. We'll support you. 
You come in, invade the country, we'll give you the crown. Because your wife marries, she's an heir. So then they invade the country. Uh, now uh, James the second he can't get anybody to fight for him, so he has to turn and flee. And then William and Mary come in, they have the glorious revolution of 1688, and then the Protestants said, we want a declaration of our rights, and we want those rights to include the right to bear arms. Because we don't want to be sitting here waiting to be massacred, as we've seen many of our fellow Christians massacred. And so this became the English Bill of Rights of 1689, and then 100 years later, that became, in a modified form, the American Bill of Rights, essentially. But that's where the right to keep and bear arms comes from. It had nothing to do with hunting, had everything to do with Christian people demanding the right to defend themselves against persecutors and mass murderers. That's where it comes from historically. And we've seen throughout the 20th century, one country after another, the Armenian Genocide, which I talked about before. What preceded the Armenian Genocide? Confiscation of arms. Confiscation of arms. And it's happened to one country after another throughout the 20th century. All right, 1968, Enoch Powell. Enoch Powell was a UK politician. He was said to be a very brilliant politician. Enoch Powell preached politically to the people of England a speech that is now known as the Rivers of Blood speech. And you can look this up, you can find it online. Powell was controversial. He was warning then that they were bringing in tens of thousands of migrants into the United Kingdom back in 1968. That's why I tell people this is not a new problem. And, and it had been going on for years to where you had neighborhoods where people were complaining their neighborhood was being overrun by these foreign migrants. And they couldn't live there anymore. The people are being pushed out of their own neighborhood. And Powell warned, he said, that if this continues, that if this continues, he could foresee rivers of blood essentially flowing in Europe if something is not done. And of course he was just completely attacked by the media. Now, one of the important points that he made, and I think this is very important to what we've been talking about, he said the same newspapers under the same owners who were telling them back in the 1930s not to be concerned about the rise of Nazism in Germany. The same media, the same press, that was telling him, oh, there's nothing to be concerned about. Don't worry about Hitler, Hitler's a nice guy. Everything's gonna be great with Hitler and the Nazis. The same media that tried to convince everybody that Hitler was not a problem, he said that same media in 1968 were trying to uh, disarm anybody's concern about having this massive flood of migrants coming into the UK. And so the media has been involved in this thing. Media propaganda has been going on throughout this whole episode. Thank the Lord we have the internet. Thank the Lord, I see the internet as it's almost like the printing press in modern times. Uh, it's a path so that people can get the truth out. People can communicate. They can tell each other what's really going on. Um, but the press has played a part in this for years. But Notice, according to Powell, it's the same press that was supporting Nazism. It is now the same press supporting this massive flow of immigrants. Winston Churchill said about Islam back in 1899. Uh, Churchill spent years in the British Army and he was stationed in North Africa and different parts of Africa while he was in the British Army. He saw Islam up close. He knew what the Islamic world was like. And he said, uh, he said, quote, individual Muslims may show splendid qualities, but the influence of the religion paralyzes the social development of those who follow it. And he said, no stronger retrograde force exists in the world. No stronger retrograde force. So what he's saying is, there is no force 
as far as he's concerned, that is stronger to turn back the progress of civilization, by which he would have generally meant Christian civilization. In other words, getting, and even, if you read this expanded quote, he talks about things like slavery and so on. Getting rid of slavery, uh, respecting the rights of others, improving society, etc. And Churchill said there's no stronger retrograde force in the world than Islam. One of my theories is that the Nazis read this quote from Churchill. They were familiar with it. They would have been familiar with him. And they thought to themselves, you know, he could be right. This could be the force that we need to overturn Christianity in the Western world. We just need to get enough Muslims into all these different countries. And they'd been weaponizing the Muslims from the 1930s and 40s. They'd seen one country after another be undermined and uh, the, the authority of Great Britain turned away. The authority of France turned away. All right, now, Vatican Council II. I think this is another very important component here because uh, if you study the situation with Nazi Germany, the Vatican and the Jesuits in particular were very involved with Nazi Germany from the, from the beginning. And there are some who believe that what Hitler was trying to do when he's invading all these different countries is he was trying to reunite the Holy Roman Empire and that the Holy Roman Emperor, going back to Charlemagne, was typically the king of Germany. And Charlemagne, that was the first Reich, then Kaiser Wilhelm, this is the second Reich. Now Hitler was gonna come in with the third Reich. And that this was going to recreate the Holy Roman Empire, which had been the empire of the Inquisition, which had been the empire that was dismantled as a result of the great Protestant Reformation. That's why the Thirty Years' War is so significant. That's why calling World War I and World War II the second Thirty Years' War is so significant. Because Churchill, it would appear, and Charles de Gaulle, seemed to recognize that this element was definitely at work. But after the war now, they have Vatican Council II. Vatican Council II is one of the most subversive documents and, and events in church history because the Vatican basically said that Christianity, they didn't come right out and say it, they said it in very wily sort of, they used sophistry and intellectual arguments and all this other kind of stuff to basically say that Christianity is the same as the pagan religions of the world, okay? And you had Pope John Paul II in Assisi, Italy in 1986. He gathered with all of these leaders of Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, American Indian shamanism, etc. He joined hands with them and said basically we're all praying to the same God. Okay? Uh, you have, there's a video online of Pope Francis, the Jesuit Pope Francis, where he's sitting there talking about God and, and then you have a, a Muslim, and you have a Hindu, and you have a Buddhist, and you have an Orthodox Jew and a Catholic priest, and they're all holding up the little icons of their religion, and the Pope is basically saying all of these are the same. Okay? That whole philosophy began with Vatican Council II. Vatican Council, here's what they said about Islam. Quote, but the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the creator in the first place among whom are the Muslims. Now just think about that. The plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the creator in the first place among whom are the Muslims. Why would they say that the Muslims are in the first place? In the first place among whom are the Muslims, these profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us, they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. Now, I can tell you, having studied Vatican II, you can go study it. Vatican II was penned, by and large, by the Jesuit order. 
and there's no question you have a very direct connection between the Jesuits and the Nazis during the Second World War. Uh, there's even a book uh, called The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris. Edmund Paris was a French journalist. You can find this book online. Uh, one of the quotes from the book that's very, very disturbing, Paris reports that the Vatican sent a communique to Francisco Franco in Spain that was published in the newspapers there in which they said, quote, Adolf Hitler, son of the Catholic Church, died while defending Christianity. That is a quote documented by Paris in his book. Okay? Now we're winding down here. Um, here is a book published not long ago called Stealth Invasion. Stealth Invasion about the coming of Islam into America. Now, and now obviously Western Europe, I'll be the first to admit, Western Europe is much farther along than we are here in the United States. There's no question we've been repeatedly warned the same movement is coming more and more to American soil. In many ways, it's already here. But the author, uh, or this is actually in the preface of the book, says, quote, Americans are shocked by ongoing news reports chronicling growing chaos in Europe where massive Muslim migration is wreaking havoc on the continent. The influx of immigrants has led to horrendous acts of mass terrorism, an epidemic of rape and sexual assault against European women, and large jihadist rich enclaves where even police are hesitant to enter. Yet few realize that America is heading down the same suicidal path. The groundwork is being laid here. Now, yesterday I talked about Operation Paperclip and how, again, after the war, many of these Nazi scientists were brought into the United States and they formed the backbone. They were Nazi scientists and they formed the backbone of the space and rocket program here in the U.S. Probably the most prominent among them was Werner von Braun, who was a Nazi. Here you see a picture of von Braun standing next to all of these Nazi officers in Germany, okay, during the war. And now, this is years later in the 1960s, after the war, Werner von Braun is at NASA. And he's standing next to all of his models of rockets that he's engineered. So he transitioned well into the United States. Now, I am one of those who believes that this has everything to do with why this leftist socialist agenda has come into our country. And I talked yesterday about how the Democratic Party in particular has adopted nearly all of the political views of the Nazis in Germany in the 1930s and 40s with abortion, with evolution, with euthanasia, with socialism, and now with Islam. In fact, many of you may have seen this, or at least some of you. In 2015 to 16, the Democrats tried to push House Resolution 569. House Resolution 569. House Resolution 569 specifically condemns violence, bigotry, and hateful rhetoric towards Muslims in the United States. And what they're doing, the narrative that they are promoting even now, is the narrative of Islamophobia, that the big problem that everybody has is supposedly Islamophobia. Okay, there's nothing worse, and it's an irrational fear of Islam. It's not that there's anything wrong with the Muslims. The problem is you. And what they want to do is they want to pass laws to punish people who are guilty of so-called Islamophobia. Now, what this is, folks, this is the doorway to Sharia law. Because Sharia law begins with a declaration that Islam is the number one religion, and if anybody insults Islam, they must be punished. Notice, there's no mention of Christianity here. No mention of some other religion or religion in general. Up in Canada, they've done the same thing. Now, thank the Lord, this has not passed. 
But the fact that they presented it shows us this is the direction they want to take the country. Now up in Canada, they have a resolution called M103, Motion 103. Basically the same thing. There they were a little bit more careful. They were condemning uh, criticism of religion, hateful rhetoric toward religion, and Islamophobia. So they threw Islamophobia in. Then what they did is the Toronto schools published a definition of Islamophobia. And they define Islamophobia in part as a negative opinion of Islamic politics. If you have a negative view of Islamic politics, then you have Islamophobia. Folks, that is the doorway to Sharia law. That's how I believe, and, and I'm not alone, there are many others out there who hold to the same view. All right. All right, I was gonna, I was gonna, I'm gonna talk about two more things. Okay, very quickly, Tim, very quickly. And Angela Merkel is the chairperson of the CDU. Now everybody's here has seen Angela Merkel bringing in all these millions of migrants into Germany. She's the chairperson of the CDU. Why is that important? This is the Christian Democratic Union Party in Germany. The history of that party, the CDU, is, it says a five of the eight chancellors who have led the Federal Republic since 1949 have been CDU members. It has its roots in the center party, a Catholic political party founded in 1870. That was the party that put Adolf Hitler and gave him his absolute power during World War II, the Catholic Center Party. And what happened was the Catholic Center Party was manipulated by Pope Pius XII to give Hitler absolute authority during the war. Then after the war, the members of the Catholic Center Party left and they went and they joined the Christian Democratic Union. And Angela Merkel is basically the, the primary leader of that party. And I believe this has everything to do with why she's just flooding all these Muslims into Germany. All right, two scriptures here as I wrap up. First John 4, 1. There is much deception going on in our country and in the churches. What does the scripture say? Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether or not they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. We have many teachers in the churches now that believe we should somehow or other embrace Islam. That, I mean, you've got these Christian leaders who think that we should help the Muslim immigrants come here and build their mosques. Now, I believe it's appropriate to be charitable toward Muslims, certainly at an individual level, and to witness to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. But to help them build a mosque, to help them build a place where they're going to deny the gospel of Jesus Christ, I don't believe that's what we're called to, brethren. I don't believe it. Can you imagine the prophet Elijah helping the priests of Baal build a temple to Baal and helping, him, you know, helping them raise money? Of course not. Of course not. But we know and it's been said that persecution, and we're seeing rising persecution against Christians all over the world. And I've heard ministers and teachers warn about this, that it could very well come to America. We've already seen the groundwork laid for it. But what does the scripture say? Paul said to Timothy, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But, he says, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Our job, brethren, I believe, is to continue in the word of God, to keep believing the gospel and preaching it to others. Praise the Lord. Thank you for listening. God bless you guys.